very excited to be uh, at the TED uh, event. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, some very simple statements. The fact that we're using up our natural capital, and that's a problem for us. It's our living system that we are tearing apart. And we're having a fever uh, at the same time. Climate change is happening sooner and faster than we think. There are solutions, but we'll need to reinvent our society, go a factor 10 better than what we do now. Um, and I want to give some examples of those. Uh, and then I'm going to show how this can actually work together and, and you know how all these solutions can come together into a societal model that's better than what we have now, that's more profitable, more attractive, um, and how it's uh, you know our moment in time in history to seize this and to actually help build this uh, better uh, world. So first this, um, can we zoom out a bit because I'm losing a part of the screen. This is um, a video of deforestation in Bolivia. And I don't have sound. It's part for illegal logging, part for uh, uh, plantation of uh, 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 animal food and uh, uh, live cattle. Um, and it's going at an unprecedented rate. This is happening in less than 30 years. And um, it's a problem. I don't know if you recognize what uh, this uh, border is. It's actually one island and two countries um, on uh, the same island. Does anybody know? Haiti on one side, yes, and the Dominican Republic on the other side. Same island, same climate, same ecosystem, but two very different sets of policies. Actually, I know a guy who lived uh, there, um, and it's simple. If you cut down illegally a tree here, you uh, end up in prison. Whereas here, everything is short term, everything is permitted, and this is a very different situation. Although it's the same climate, the people on the left are using up their life support systems. It's a bit like a bank. If you have money on your bank, you can have interest on that capital. If your money decreases, if you're using it up, your interest, the green bar here, decreases as well. Well, in natural systems, we're talking not of interest, but of ecosystem services. It's are the things that we get for free from our living systems, uh, but that are essential to our life support. Water purification, flood management, uh, pollination, buffering against weather extremes, soil formation, and not in the least, recycling with photosynthesis, CO2 into oxygen. So we're using up our capital, and we are losing the services as we go. And it's obviously a problem. Pollination, for instance, uh, if this goes, if bees die, for instance, uh, you know, it uh, spells trouble for us. Some economists actually try to put a figure on this. Uh, quite recently, there were a lot of studies uh, starting, and they estimate that it's $44 trillion worth of services that we get for free from nature. It's ridiculous to put a figure on it, but to give you an idea, uh, what that would be, um, a trillion, by the way, in Dutch uh, would be 44,000 uh, billion uh, dollar, because billion and trillion is different in English and in Dutch. Uh, it's in the order of magnitude of the gross domestic product of the whole world, which is uh, 61 for the moment, uh, compared to Belgium. It's uh, uh, quite much more than what we uh, turn out in services. But it's ridiculous to put a figure on it. Why? Because some of these services have no known replacement at any cost. We cannot engineer pollination. We cannot devise a CO2 or recycling machine that uh, refuels the whole world with uh, oxygen. And actually, we tried. Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember 92, 93 in Arizona, Biosphere 2, grand experiment, $200 million intended to offer a life support system for eight people during two years. And after less than one year, they had to reopen the system. 
uh, to let in uh, oxygen. And all the ideas of, uh, you know, self-sustaining cycles that were engineered uh, and designed by scientists and, and engineered uh, turned out not to work as uh, intended. So climate uh, change, I'll get that to, uh, in a moment, but um, ecosystem services, they are actually far more critical to human prosperity than just the resources that uh, we're using. Um, and some of these services have no substitute at any price. So that, uh, that's a very important first message I want to give to you uh, for a moment. So this is our life support system, and at the same time, we're running a fever, which comes at a bad time, really, because our capacity to you know, deal with this is uh, weakened. I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about climate change because we, we know and hear already uh, so much about it. Uh, just this, this came out a month ago. Uh, it's by NOAA, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's a bit like NASA, but then for the air and the oceans in the US. And they just uh, released a report uh, saying, uh, you know, that 48 scientific organizations in, in uh, 48 different countries come to the conclusion that the three last decades that we've had are completely, uh, uh, incredibly, uh, you know, uh, wrong in terms of climate change. And they, uh, they have a nice uh, graph here that says, if you were to think about a warming world, what would you expect to see in that world? And they define 10 indicators. Sea surface temperature rise, humidity rise, glaciers uh, disappearing, snow covers. Seven of them should rise. And three of them should decrease if our world was warming. Big surprise, all of that is happening, actually, in the last uh, couple of decades in both senses. And so they actually made a very nice uh, uh, information graph. It's uh, what they call a climate change uh, dashboard. You can uh, look it up on, on their site. And they map. It's like, uh, you know, you can follow it in real time. Climate change as it happened. Climate change TV, if you will. Um, they have different uh, indicators, carbon dioxide. Maybe it's interesting, you see the temperature on the uh, top there, carbon dioxide level going up. Sun energy staying more or less the same. You know, a bit of fluctuation, but you cannot immediately attribute it to it. Sea level gently rising, and our Arctic sea ice uh, significantly uh, decreasing. So this global climate change dashboard is updated uh, yearly, and you can see it unfold there. Uh, before your eyes. But I'm not a pessimist because I've been doing this for uh, 11 years and uh, I would probably have uh, stopped this a long time if I didn't believe that we have solutions at hand, that we can actually change this crisis into an opportunity that's better for all of us, that makes the world more attractive, more profitable, more exciting. So what will we need to do to get there? I won't explain too much. This is the only technical graph that I have. But it's important for you to understand where the figures come from. You, you hear about Copenhagen. They negotiate about 20, 30, 25% how much we should reduce. It's like a cattle uh, market almost. You know, how, how much are you willing to, uh, to pay for it? But, you know, the truth is there's, there's no real alternative. Either we want to solve this or not. And if we want to solve it, we have to just look at the facts. And the facts are this. We are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and our ecosystem services can absorb some of that. The oceans mostly, the soil, vegetation. But as our world is warming, this absorption capacity decreases. So the amount of CO2 that actually works as a greenhouse is the difference between the two, is what is emitted and, um, you know, the difference between what can be absorbed and is emitted goes into the atmosphere and heats up. So this is the reduction we need. We don't need to go from 26 to 15, but we need to go to 10 gigatons of CO2 uh, per year. It's very abstract. Nobody knows what it means. But if you look forward a bit, we will be with about 9, 9.5 billion people. So it's almost one ton of CO2 per person that we will be allowed to emit at that time. 
this should bring us in a level that's considered safe because then at that time we're not adding any new CO2 into the atmosphere. What does that mean if you look at uh, where we are now, actually? If we say one, one ton of CO2 per person per year, what does it mean? Well, it does mean not very good news because everywhere we are way above this limit for the moment. In Belgium it's 12.3, in Europe it's about 10 tons of CO2 per person per year. So it's a big challenge. If we want to reach this target, we're speaking about reductions in the order of magnitude of 90% by the middle of the century. I see it not as 90% reduction, but as a, a factor 10 improvement. And there are many people and individuals and, and organizations that actually uh, see it in the same way. We think it's not only necessary and possible, but also attractive and, and profitable. And I want to show some examples of that and then close with um, a personal thought. I'm going to skip this. Just a couple of examples. Maybe I'll skip some because I only have six minutes and 35 seconds left. This is a, a good one, actually. It's uh, from the National Geographic in 2007, I think. A power plant that produces electricity with gas uh, in Texas saw the demand for electricity rise, like it is everywhere. So they were planning to build a new one, like you see on the back there. Huge investment, enormous uh, planning. And instead of doing that, they actually worked with their corporate and private customers to reduce the electricity demand by giving incentives for energy efficient um, appliances and by working with audits for the corporate clients. And they could reduce the whole plant capacity of this new plant could be reduced. So they didn't have to build a new plant. They gained money by not investing. And all the clients saw their energy bill cut by almost uh, half. Mobility solutions, you know, it's not only for CO2, it's for reasons of uh, respiratory disease. 3% of the people in Europe that die, die from pollution related to automobile or vehicle uh, emissions. 3%. It's incredible, huh? that's a study by the Lancet a couple of years ago. So it's not only traffic jams and, and you know, uh, CO2, but it's also a very direct uh, health aspect. And it will become this if we don't uh, uh, think about it uh, too early. At the same time, we have these crazy inventions where we drive with the car and we go to the fitness and then we sit on a treadmill uh, to have a bit of uh, activity and mobility in our, our life. Uh, I know the guy who uh, played uh, here, Steph Camille, is a big uh, biker. So there's uh, a lot of incentives for us to go back to a bit of uh, common sense, use our bikes as exercise, but also as mobility. And this, I think, is a great example. Romtom, you know them. It's a success story now, but it's a guy who built his foldable bikes for 30 years, went bankrupt almost twice, and continued to do so. And now, you know, his business is exploding and he's uh, working well. So I think, you know, Instead of doing this, we can do this. And uh, it actually enhances our mobility. It dramatically reduces our CO2 print. And it can be fun, too. This is us uh, in Leuven. There's a nice skate ball. And the Bromptoms actually fit uh, perfectly to, uh, to go into the skate ball over a, a lunch break. This is another great uh, example, I think, in uh, Curitiba. There was a previous TED talk about that. The mayor of Curitiba spoke about this. He's speaking all over the world now. This is a mayor who had a vision and who didn't, you know, wait for authorities and decisions, but who managed through the red tape, who did things his way. And in 83 cities now, his model is being uh, copied, the model of bus rapid transit. It's, um, you know, an enhanced way of using buses, but they are as efficient as uh, metros. You don't have to build, build tunnels uh, or have large investment. It's just larger buses with bus stops that are at the height of the bus so people can get out in, in and out easily. Uh, you can buy your ticket and validate it in the bus shelter. And there's a separated uh, lane for the buses. So there's a very high frequency. In, uh, uh, during peak hours, every minute almost, there's a bus passing. It's, it's like a metro, uh, but it has a dramatically lower uh, footprint. 70% of the people in Curitiba use it, and they have, on average, 30% less 
emissions per person. Another mobility solutions, it's uh, not the solution that will save the world, of course, you know it maybe, it's a Tesla. Uh, first, to my mind, uh, workable commercial electrical car. It's very niche still for the moment, but it has uh, some spin-offs already. The electrical smart, the 1,000 were built last year in France, are equipped with Tesla um, batteries. Toyota has bought a stake, Mercedes is buying a stake, and uh, in just over a year, Tesla is bringing out um, a family car. Five plus two people uh, will be the price of a Renault Espace or something. It's not for everybody yet, but it's a mainstream car. But most important, it has a very long high re action radius, um, which is not the case with most of the electric cars that you see uh, coming out for the moment. This is uh, a map of where you can charge, so it's happening now, you know, you have already some um, uh, charging spots in, um, in Belgium. Not as many as, as in other countries, but uh, it's starting to happen. I'm going to have one or two minutes extra, thank you. Um, how does it all come together? Well, most of the solutions I've shown are solutions to reduce the energy demand. That's where it all starts. Because we can make savings with that, and with these savings we can finance building smarter grids that know when somebody produces or when somebody demands electricity, and that actually distributes this energy. And then, on larger scale, these savings can obviously help uh, produce uh, uh, wind energy, but also concentrated solar power which is a very cheap or a cheaper way to use uh, solar energy to produce steam, very old technology actually, produce steam and then create uh, electricity with that. And this comes together in what is called the super grid, uh, in which uh, as time goes by, as we are saving energy and saving money, we can invest and actually build this infrastructure. And the thing is, there's a study called Roadmap 2050, whether we choose for this or we choose to stick with fossil fuel based power generation, it's almost the same price. Why? Because most of our ancient fossil fuel plants will need to be updated somewhere. So in the years to come, we have the choice. Do we switch to something modern or do we uh, embrace this new uh, structure? If it all works well, there's an added benefit, I think. Um, it's that not only we're reducing our CO2 impact, but we're also maybe reintegrating people in the South who have traditionally been left out of the economic game because they have a new source of income. And it's not uranium or fossil fuel or gas, but it's a solar income that's permanent, that is distributed, and that's crucial to go to this uh, new model. So I think this is our moment in time. This is where we can choose whether we embrace this or whether we hope that somebody else comes and, uh, you know, solves it for us. Or maybe we just hope that it goes by and solves it itself. Um, I have more slides to show, but that will be for another time because my time is up. What I wanted to say is that we have a planet in crisis. There's still a lot of people trying to uh, think otherwise, but we have a planet in crisis. We can now take this crisis and see it as an opportunity for what is the next industrial revolution, where we put more people to work to design a system that's more profitable on the one hand, but that's also more attractive, more healthy, more low carbon. And if we seize our moment, maybe in 10 or 15 years, we will look back and say, you know, we were there, we realized it, and we started laying the foundation for a bright, green future. And I invite you all to be part of this. Thank you. <clears throat>